I want to speak to you this morning on the subject. Sin is a losing game. Sin is a losing game. Our text is found in verse 25. Your iniquities have turned away these things, and your sins have withholden good things from you. Your iniquities have turned away these things, and your sins have withholden good things from you. Now, if you were to read carefully the book of Jeremiah, you'd find that largely this book is a book of sermons. Jeremiah was a preacher. He was a great preacher. Jeremiah was a weeping preacher. No more tender heart you'll ever read of in the Word of God than that of Jeremiah. On one occasion he said, Oh, that my head were a fountain of waters, that I might weep over the hurt of the daughter of my people. Jeremiah was a preacher, but not only a preacher, but he was a preacher who cared and a preacher who was concerned. And to him God spoke these words, and he preached this sermon. But Jeremiah was an outspoken preacher. Jeremiah told it as it was. I don't believe there's any other kind of preaching that's worth listening to, except preaching that's based upon the Word of God and tells the truth and tells it honestly and tells it sincerely. Now here, Jeremiah is dealing with sin. This is a chapter on the sins of the Lord's people. These are not the heathen nations. These are not the outside people. This is a chapter that deals with the sins of the Lord's people. You know, some folks say sin doesn't exist. There are people in the world today that will tell you there is no such thing as sin. For instance, there's a group of religious people. They're blind and they're lost because they know absolutely nothing about the redeeming gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. But there's a group of people who will tell you there's nothing good or bad. You only make it so by thinking it so. That's the philosophy of the devil. It is bad because God says it's bad. And it is only good because God says it's good. And what man thinks about it does not change or alter it, not in one iota. And some people say there is no such thing as sin. Others say, well, there is sin, but people can't help it. We're all uh, children of Adam, and, and we're born with an Adamic nature, and an expression that's used throughout every bit of society is, well, there's nobody perfect. And they use that as an excuse for doing wrong and for sinning against God. And they say, sin cannot be helped. But now God doesn't look at it that way. God doesn't say that, that sin doesn't exist. God doesn't say it's only sin if you think it is, and not sin if you don't think it is. God doesn't say that man sins because he can't help himself. God says that sin kills, and God says that sin brings death. The wages of sin is death. God goes on to say that he punishes sin, and I want to deal with that this morning. I believe that there are many Christian people who think they can sin, they'll get by with it, they never need make it right and ask God to forgive them. And I want to deal with four things in this chapter this morning that have to do with sin. I would like you to notice, first of all, the problem. For God says, your iniquities have turned away these things. Now God is dealing with your sin. You know, that's the hardest thing in the world for any of us to do is to think about our sins. No problem to think about our neighbors. Oh, we can think of that and God have mercy even talk of it. But God is interested in dealing with your sins, my sins. God wants this thing to be a personal thing. And God says in Numbers 32 and 23, be sure your sin will find you out. Now, you better listen to that this morning. Be sure your sin, not someone else's, be sure your sin will find you out. Can I say it again? Sin is not something that God looks at lightly. God says, be sure your sin will find you out. And it does. By the time this morning, 
I'd like to give you the setting for that verse of Scripture. Uh, when God said, be sure your sin will find you out. And show you how history and the Word of God itself has proven that verse to be true as God spoke it. Be sure your sin will find you out. I don't know how many times I've had people come to me after I've preached and they'd say, well, preacher, you really gave it to them today. Did you hear it? Gave it to them. Preacher, you really let them have it today. Did you hear it? Let them have it. That's a, that's a philosophy of life with a lot of people. But God today wants to speak to you as a question about your sin. Be sure your sin will find you out. Find you out in your countenance. It'll find you out in your physical constitution. You know, every sin that crawls across the mind of a human being leaves its indelible mark. Sin will find you out. I believe people will live longer who sin less. I believe people are healthier who sin less. I believe sin destroys mental faculties and physical constitution. It'll find you out in your countenance and in your physical constitution. It'll find you out in your children. There's no two ways about it. God's Word says He visited the sins of the fathers from the third and the fourth generation. May I speak to you parents today. I'm not just talking about the sins of immorality, though I'm talking about that. Remember, God says, your sins will find you out. They'll find you out in your children. Children go wrong. They become drunkards. They become whoremongers. They become adulterers. They become of sinful and immoral because of their parents, their mothers and fathers live that way. And God said, be sure your sin will find you out. You know the sin the Lord wants to deal with is your sin. Is your sin. My sin. God wants this thing to be an individual thing. He doesn't want people hiding behind other people. For when he spoke about what he wanted to do with sin, in Isaiah 1, 18, he said, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. You see, the Lord wants to do something about your sins. You know, the hardest thing in the world is for Christians to face themselves. They face other people's sins. They are conscious of other people's shortcomings. They say one to another, I'm living as good as you are, or I'm living better than you are. But God says, I want to deal with your sins. You know, Christians can lie. I know Christians that it's become a way of life for them to lie. They lie about everything. They lie themselves out of everything. They think. But remember, God said, be sure... Your sin will find you out. You know, you tell one lie, you have to tell another to support it. You finally tell so many, you don't remember how you told it. Then you start telling it differently. And God's holy word says, be sure your sin will find you out. You know what's wrong with a Christian who has no joy and no victory? One little three-letter word, S-I-N, sin. That's what God said. In Isaiah uh, chapter 59, verses 1 and 2, he said, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save. Now listen, there's no, there's no lack of power in the omnipotent hand of God to save people. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save. Neither is his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. God isn't deaf. The Lord can hear the prayers of people if they're prayed rightly. The Lord can save people when things are as they ought to be. But now listen to it. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God. And your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. You see, God says, your sins, your sins, your sins. Oh, if God could start Right in this pulpit today, 
with this preacher and every man and woman in this building this morning and have every Christian look within introspectively and consider what you need to do about your sin. God says, I go my way and you shall seek me and shall die in your sins. And whither I go, you cannot come. You know, the Lord said a lot of folks are going to die in their sins. I think that means a lot of Christian people. You know, there's some sins God never will judge that you're interested in. God will never judge your past sins if you're a Christian today. He's already judged them. Two thousand years ago, when the Lord Jesus hung upon the cross, robed in blood and crowned with thorns, and covered with fiddle and shame, God laid upon him the iniquity of us all. And Jesus Christ paid the death for my sins. And thank God when one is saved, he never has to be judged for his past sins. There are some other sins you don't need to be judged for. If you will do what God says in 1 John 1, 9, we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When you confess your sins, you never have to be judged, Father. He borrowed to the church at Corinth and he said, if we judge ourselves, we shall not be judged. That is, if we confess our sins as a Christian to Jesus, he forgives them and you'll not be judged, Father. Oh, that Christian who said, "Why well, I can get by with it. Why, it's all, it's only, it's all right. I don't feel badly about it. But it's what does God say about it? God says you're responsible for them and your sin will find you out. Now I'll tell you there's going to be a day when men and women shall stand at the judgment seat of Christ. And if you've not confessed your sins to God before then, the Lord will deal with your sins at the judgment seat. Now, I want you to think the problem. The problem is your sins. And that's what God says. Your sins have withholding good things from you. Now, you say, preacher, people that live in sin have a good time. Oh, I know the Bible says, speaks of the pleasures of sin for a season. And the good time, the laughter of the world and the thrill of the world is most transient and temporary. But I want you to know today that God said sin cost a Christian something. The penalty. Good things have been withheld from you. Now, first of all, sin will cost you your joy. You know, we talk a lot about attitudes of people. And we talk about people's uh, frame of mind. And we talk about whether they have a positive or negative approach to life. But you know, for a Christian, there's only one of two alternatives. If you're right with God, you have joy. If there's sin in your life, you lose it. And that is the criterion God goes by. Sin causes one to lose the joy of his salvation. You don't lose your, joy, your salvation. You lose the joy of it. Classic illustration is uh, David, who sinned against God with murder and Im immorality. And one day, David, in Psalm 51, the great penitential prayer, David prayed, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. David lost his joy. You know, that's what's wrong with a lot of Christians. I'm just convinced this morning, as much as I've ever been convinced of anything in my life, that there are Christian people that are unhappy, they're miserable, and there's only one answer to it. There's unconfessed sin in their life they have not come to Jesus Christ with. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. You know the most unattractive thing in the world to an outsider is a miserable Christian. Why would a person in the world want to be like a Christian who's lost his joy? And sin, the Bible says, uh, your sins have withholding good things from you. You want to be happy? I think that's a basic need of every human life. I think even an unsaved psychologist would tell you that one of the basic needs of human beings is they desire to be happy. But Christian, you'll never be happy 
until you're right with God. For sin causes a Christian to lose his joy. You lose something else. You lose something that whether it means much to you this morning or not will mean everything in the world to you sometime. I do not believe there's a human being but what comes to great crises in life. And when that time comes, the thing you will want more than anything else in the world will be answered prayer. You want God to hear you. I never will forget a young lady stood back there in the back of this auditorium years ago, a young mother and wife. And I came in that door. She walked toward me with the tears streaming down her face. She reached out and she got me by the hand and she said, Pastor, you know me. You've known me since I was a little girl. You know about my life. And she said, you know, my little child is under in the city hospital. And the doctors say only a miracle will ever save his life. And that young mother and that young woman said to me, Pastor, what I want today more than I've ever wanted anything in my life is for God to hear my prayers. She said, I want God to answer me. I want God to hear my prayer and save my little child. I want it more than anything, she said. And I talked to her and prayed for her and thanked God the Lord answered prayer. But he didn't until I was a broken heart and a getting right with God. You know, a lot of people say, well, I'm not getting my prayers answered. There's only one thing keeps prayer from being answered. Only one. It's not because it isn't the will of God. It's, it's not because you're asking too much or too little. There's only one thing God says that keeps prayer from being answered. And that's sin in the life of a Christian. Read it in the Bible, Psalm 66, 18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Thy sins have withholden good things from thee. The joy of salvation. The, the, the ability to get answers to your prayers. It'll cost you something else. It'll cost you the souls of your loved ones. Only God knows how many people are lost on the way to hell today who have a Christian in their family. And that Christian in their family many times is not interested and not right with God and people go to hell who have a Christian right in their home. You know, you read this in the Bible, Psalm 51, 13, David said, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. And now listen to it. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Then and only then when I get my joy back when I confess this to God, when I tell Jesus about it, and that's the one to tell. You know, I don't believe God ever meant for one person to be confessing his sins to another person. I do not believe in that that's found in the Bible. You know why? First of all, there's not a human being on earth that can cleanse you from your sin. Not one. Why tell it to someone who can do nothing about it when the Lord says that he's the one that can do something about it. God says in his word, if you, if you are in sin in your life as a Christian, you can't teach transgressors the ways of the Lord and get people saved. I just believe the Bible teaches that some people do not prosper because they have sin in their life. Jeremiah 3 and 3 says, Therefore the showers have been withholden, and there has been no latter rain. God said your crops have not done well because you've been in sin. And God said, I'm withholding some things from you. I know this applies to many areas of a Christian's life. I'll tell you it applies to the area we spoke of a little while ago about giving to the Lord Jesus for the support of the gospel and the sending of it around the world. God said, uh, you, you're going to lose a good thing. You're going to lose the blessing of prosperity. You know, you can lose your testimony. I'm talking to people this morning. You couldn't lead a soul to Christ this morning. But if someone would hand you a Bible and put your hand in the hand of a sinner, you couldn't lead him to Christ. You know why? Because your testimony is gone. You're like, some of you are like that of Simon Peter. 
warmed his hands at the devil's fire and three times said, I'm not a Christian, and cursed and swore and lost his testimony. And he never got it back until he got back right with God. Your sins, God said, have withholding good things from you. Now then notice, I have talked to you about the problem and I've talked to you about the penalty and I want you to think a little bit about the people. Oh, we Christians, you know, we're great at saying, lay it on these crooked politicians. Talk about all the looseness and, and thievery and crime that's going on out in the world and in the gutters. No, God said, for among my people are found wicked men. You know, the Lord has given a, a formula for revival. And there's only one. It's not advertising. It's not getting big crowds. It's not good preaching. There's only one formula for revival. Only one. And that's given in, in the Word of God in Second Chronicles 7, 14. God said, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. There's no other formula in this world that will bring revival. You could have the best evangelist in the world and you'll not have revival. You'll only have revival when God's people do what God said God's people are supposed to do. I think I told you about an experience I had uh, when, well, 30, uh, about close to 34 years ago, 33 and a half years ago, we bought the little Castle Inn building. It had a safe in it. Now, I never had a safe in my life. Great big iron safe. Never needed one. Never had anything anybody wanted to steal in all my life. And I didn't have any use for that safe whatsoever. There it was in this little old deserted tavern building where this church began 33 and a half years ago. I tried to open it, and I couldn't. Has a little knob there and a lot of numbers and a little indicator at the top where you turn numbers and so forth. And a, there was a formula, but I didn't know what it was. I'd sit in front of it in a chair and I'd turn to all kinds of combinations. Left and right, left and right. Turn the handle, nothing happened. You know why? You couldn't open it without a formula. One day I called the realtor and I said, did anyone leave the formula that opens this safe? I wanted to see if there's anything in it. I couldn't open it. He said, yes. Gave me, I believe, three numbers. And you start to the left, and you turn to one, and back to the right one, and back to the left another, and he gave me the formula. I sat down in the chair, turned to those three numbers, turned the handle as a little click, and off, out came the door about that thick of solid iron and steel. And I opened the safe because I had the formula. And you know that God speaks of the heavens being like brass to a Christian. They're like brass to a Christian. They won't open. They will not open until a Christian comes with a formula for opening the windows of heaven. There's only one. My people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. You know, God's always talking about his people. He said, I've seen the affliction of my people. He said to Pharaoh, let my people go. You know, that's what you are. You're the Lord's people. And you're the people God wants to deal with. This, this, this message closes with a fourth thing in this chapter, and that is the pardon. The Lord said, run to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem. See now and know and seek in the broad places thereof if you can find a man. If there be any that executeth judgment and seeketh the truth, then I will pardon it. God said, if there's somebody that wants pardon, I'll give it to them. This chapter closes with a tremendous question. What will you do in the end thereof? You know, nobody wants to think about the end. Nobody wants to. They don't want to think about the day you die. The day you meet God. The day you stand at the judgment seat. God says, what will you do in the end thereof. What are you going to do? What will you do in the end thereof? You better have pardon now. That's what God wants. He wants, he wants to pardon those who've sinned. I've read of two cases. They're actual cases. I somewhere have in my, in my things the actual names, dates, 
the political officials involved, the prisons involved, the whole thing. But twice in our history, it is a known fact that pardons have been sent to men in penitentiaries, and they would not accept them. One many years ago in the state of Pennsylvania, there was a pardon sent by the governor of a state to a man, and the man said, I don't want it. I will not accept it. They talked about it in high places. What do you do where there's a man who's in bondage and he doesn't want to be free? And they said, this pardon is only good if it's accepted. And if he does not want it, let him remain in bondage as long as he will. You know, that's true of a Christian. You don't want the shackles broken and sins forgiven and accept the pardon from the Lord. You don't have to. I'll tell you what you do have to do. You have to face the matter in the end thereof. What will you do in the end thereof if you refuse God's pardon? Now, shall we pray? Thy sins and thine iniquities have withholden good things from you. Good things. Good things are withheld from people because of sin. May God speak to our hearts today. Every heart in this room.